welcome to Online Law School. My name is Gabriela Romero. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Student Bar Association and Chair of the Ethics Committee that uh, co-sponsored this event with the Museum of Political Corruption. I'm really glad to have you guys here. This is a really uh, great documentary, a very relevant topic for uh, all the alternative truths that have been happening, alternative facts. Uh, I'm very excited to have all of you guys here, and I'd love to introduce Bruce Roeder, President of the Museum of Political Uh, I'm thrilled to be partnering this event uh, with Albany Law School and Salty Features uh, to present this program to you. I expect this is going to be a really amazing program tonight. The Museum of Political Corruption is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization chartered in 2015 with a mission to educate the public about corruption. The MPC and its outreach wing, the Center for Ethical <coughs> Governance, recognizes the importance of learning our lessons from the past so we can effectively build better government. To those overwhelmed with the many headlines these past years, the MPC intends to offer historical perspective, and to those who feel unable to effect positive change, the MPC hopes to offer a renewed sense of empowerment. I look forward to telling you more about the MPC at the gathering we plan for across the street at the recovery room immediately following uh, tonight's program. Uh, for tonight's program, we are going to view the film Dishonesty, The Truth About Lies. And this is certainly an appropriate venue. I'm reminded that we're here in a courtroom where people are sworn to tell the truth. In light of our museum's mission, I've been giving this topic of lies some good thought. Obviously, not all lies are corruption. Still, I can't help but believe that behind most corruption resides an initial lie. Perhaps something to be explored later, but for now, it is my great privilege to introduce the dynamic filmmaker of Dishonesty, The Truth About Lies, Yael Melanie, to introduce her film. Strategies and institutions, 
that in some ways have been deployed by uh, uh, more powerful nations uh, or less powerful uh, nations uh, and have also resulted in, in a very uh, uh, uneven geography of, of ethical and unethical uh, uh, perceptions or behavior. So, um, so I know a little bit about Transparency International, but not a lot. And I think one of the problems with um, if you, issues of ethics and with a lot of issues is that the answer is not one size fits all. And so, you know, in some situations, transparency is excellent. In some situations, transparency is not always um, the best thing. So, so I think you have to take it case by case. Um, the film has become part of a larger project called the Dishonesty Project. And one of the things that we're trying to do is change the way ethics training happens in as many realms as we can with the idea that being reminded about our better selves can help us act better. So most ethics training in corporations, in government, in schools happens with a focus once a year. And we're trying to change the model to be at least once a month. So we're doing different programs with some corporations and with um, an institute at Duke called DCRI for healthcare professionals. And we hope to test that um, uh, around, and also for schools. We did a big curriculum for middle school and high school students with some adaptations of the experiments in the film with m &Ms, which I really love. Um, so we're hoping to, to find schools that will work with us uh, to see how, how, the, um, how the curriculum can, can become part of the fabric of why did you choose to make this movie? So, movies are strange things. Um, we did not set out to make this movie. We, Dan and I were working on a TV series. Um, we kind of met by chance, decided to start working together. We're actually related. We've never met growing up, um, but we are related. And, um, and we started working together, and one thing led to another. His book, his third book, so Dan, Dan's best known for his first book called Predictably Irrational, about how we think we're some irrational people, but we act irrationally all the time. And we can't rationalize our way out of irrationality without the experiment. Um, that led to another book on irrationality, and the third book he wrote was The Honest Truth About Dishonesty, How We Lie to Everyone, Especially Ourselves. And as that book came out, he said to me, you know, the TV series isn't going anywhere. I want to interview real people, people who lied and who've paid the price as a result. And so we did a lot of research and brought people in. And some of them we met today, there were 40, I think we interviewed about 40 people. And we were so taken with the people that we met along the way, and it felt to both of us, from a filmmaker perspective and from a science perspective, that it was giving us insight into something that keeps repeating itself, but we don't get a handle on. Um, so I said, Dan, I think there's a movie in this. And he said, great, let's make a movie. Um, I, I, I like Ariely's work a lot, and, and I think what he's doing is a very important thing, especially for, and, and I really like the movie, but it's not like being honest? Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, no, I'm just leaving it to one of us, it was a criticism. Um, yeah. the, um, I, I, and I like the challenge of classical economics that he presents, both experimental and conceptually. But I wonder if there was some, there was some kind of deception here as a consequence of one, the fact that you know him, and that he's primarily he's driving the film in terms of the, you know, the, the direction of the film, work. it's all built around his his historical work, and um, and it, uh, that that work is primarily experimental. And so it doesn't you, while while you are you are shifting over to real world experiences, what is shown in the experiments is not real world. So when the stakes are different, when the context is different. We get different kinds of behavior, and so that the, the problem of, say, Bernie Madoff or uh, or the 2008 collapse is, in a certain sense, not the same problem as the problem we face when either we're you know we're lying about the experiments, that, you know, our, our our results in the experiments that are given to us, or the little white lies and the other kinds of lies that we conventionally are involved in as any kind of person. So so that the problem ends up kind of being personalized. In, in the way in which you're telling it. And, and, the, and the question is? And the question is, you know, <laughs> what, what about all the other larger deceptions that are much more clearly 
a consequence of the way in which the world is constructed and lived. So that so that it's not simply my lives are not the same as bringing that off the lives. Right. And, no, I, and I, but I think so. What we what I like about bringing a filmmaker and scientists together is that I feel like the science gives us insight into how this behavior can happen in a very experimental kind of defined way. We chose stories to match with the science, but if you looked at any of those stories, I think it was the science compounded. So Mary Lee Jones' story is self-deception, but it's probably another, you know, one could add other factors. And for example, the two, um, the two people who we had, Garrett and Matt, that's a story of collaboration, but it's also a story of conflict of interest. So I think when you look at any of any big story, it's it's a lot of factors compounded, and we chose to highlight one. But really, this film intends to say, you know, we are all. Tan often says in these Q and As, he says, if you put Mother Teresa in the middle of the economic um, before the economic crisis, would she have um, been tempted to? to sell things at a higher price. Like, if we're put in certain systems, um, how much could all of us avoid becoming part of it? So, and I think that's that's very true. So the whole discourse is to get away from bad apples and good apples and look at the systems that we're part of. So our hope is to say, you know, it's easy to blame all bankers. It's easy to blame all politicians. But what can we do about the systems to make them better? I don't, I'm not an expert on my history, so I'm sorry. And it's funny you mentioned her because she actually uh, enjoyed the largesse of Charlie Savings Alone scandal and flew around the country and tried to check. She liked hanging out with her. Yeah, that's Right. 
and they actually stole money when they were allowed to pay themselves. And Dan's perspective and analysis on that, and of course it's a, it's a um, projection, is that once you think, once you feel that a system is corrupt, you have no problem punishing that system. You abandon all the moral fiber. So just to, just to take it a step further, can I uh, have a moment now? Yes, please. Please take a seat. You, you'll have a shot at her again, but I want to bring the rest of the panelists in because we're running out of uh, we're run out of time if we don't. Um, uh, this is an interesting panel of people. Uh, we're mostly involved in uh, politics and um, no dishonesty today. Yeah. 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 I'm so totally out of her head because I moved my student listening to the latest from Washington. And uh, there's quite a bit about dishonesty coming out in those stories today. And my goal, which is journalism, um, we we're ill equipped to figure out even how to cover it, much less to figure out how to change it, which is really what we talked about with the first night. Um, we can't figure out whether you should call a lie a lie. Do you call the President of the United States a liar if he's saying something that's demonstrably untrue about a liar? Well, no, they, many, many journalists will because you don't know his intent. I teach in a journalism school now. When I went to a journalism school, we were taught never say lie. You say, this is what the person said, and we have no support, or we can't find any evidence that backs it, or everyone else in the world, including his own lawyers, disagree with him, but you never say the word liar. And now journalists are switching, should they or not. So dishonesty and what to do about it is very concerning to me. So I'm looking forward myself to hearing from uh, some of the other panels saying, can we bring them up? You all have sheets, so I'm not going to do long introductions. We're going to try to lay a corner. Executive Director of Niper, his job is to try to keep politicians honest or, or scream loudly if they don't. <laughs> we have um, two politicians. We have, thank you. We have uh, Mr. John McDonald. You, you, may, you may sit wherever you sit. Take a place. Uh, John McDonald serving now in the State Assembly, and we have Cecilia uh, Katchik, who has served, has served in the State Assembly. Uh, that, those are both said, sorry, I'm so sorry, I did not, I practiced so much on your name, and then I got the title one. Um, so this, these are bodies that have come into some criticism about um, ethics with the law office, so they are very good. And we have uh, Professor Michael Hutter, who is also with us. So I'm going to, does anybody want to say anything right away, or shall I start writing questions? All right, well, so like, um, I'll say that. I want you to know, Easier to do 
aspect that may actually have uh, a, a bigger impact. There's a lot of the stories that were told where the little lie leads to the big scandal. I've watched it happen in the years that I've been all day, where people start off doing something small, they get away with it, they think they can keep cutting the corners, it keeps getting bigger, they know that no one's watching, there's no other issue, uh, and then the next thing they're reading in the front page of the paper. So it's sort of that, that part of the movie sort of structured in a way that uh, I'm surprised. I, I thought the movie was, was fascinating. So, I mean, I don't want anybody to come out of this thinking we're 
so naive that you know just pledging is going to make everybody act better. But it's a very small intervention that can have, even if it has a little bit of a an effect, um, really costs so little. So I think trying to experiment with that more, trying to make ethics more salient from a very young age, from middle school, high school, um, I think is, is a great thing. And politicians, I think, do need to come together and try to figure out how to make it more salient and how to make it more um, respected as, as an issue. Professor, your thoughts? Well, it, it's interesting. I, I came to this program you know, thinking more about political corruption, politics, etc. But really what the film opened my eyes to, and obviously I had, it's there, but I never really thought about it, is the extensiveness of dishonesty, uh, the pervasiveness, uh, not just of politics, that's a small, small faction. And I think in many respects the focus on that point is not really going to be very helpful at this time. But we saw whether it's a professional athlete, Wall Street, colleges, everyone, and I think picking up with what you said, the key here is education at an early age. Um, people have to start realizing the consequences of their actions, the, the idea that we have to have ethical uh, norms. And if we, if we start ignoring that, and if you look at all that stuff that's going on in that film across the board, it's scary. Right, where is this ultimately going to end up? It's got to stop. Um, yes, you know, it's easy to pick on a po po politicians quite, quite easily, but I think maybe the idea would be much broader education. And I think your point about saliency is really very, very, very important. Now, in law schools, we have to do that through ethics. We have ethical training. When I, was in, when I graduated from law school, no one took a course in ethics or professional responsibility. The idea was, well, of course you want to be an ethical lawyer. Uh, just go out there and you know what's right, do the right thing. And with Watergate, when Watergate came, came on, now we realize that we're all the, the prime actors in that were lawyers. And they were the, the, most, the worst miscreants of all. Then we started going on the training into law school about ethics. And again, we still have our, our, our scoundrels out there, but fortunately they're few and farther between. Because lawyers now are aware that if they get caught, they're finished. And why, why throw away a career mainly because maybe you can get a few more dollars or, or deceive an opponent? It's going to catch up with you. But the idea there, we cleaned up the legal profession uh, from where it was. If you think back to the dark ages of Watergate, let's do some more on that. And Preet's certainly cleaning up Wall Street. Uh, that's a, a clearly an obvious uh, target. But now maybe let's focus on getting in, not just in the colleges, uh, but also high school, junior high, maybe even started with the elementary schools. I'm not so sure it's, that's too young an age. But the idea is to get this whole point across. And I think if you, I'm, I think I'd love to show this film to my grandkids. Uh, I think in that respect, it's something that I should start really thinking, talking to them about. Because they're going to be out there uh, very shortly. They are out there. But I think in that respect, but I, I think this, this, the film is really terrific is that it, Again, in my view, the extensiveness of this, and it's really becoming problematic. And within your time. So, first of all, in full disclosure, I did not watch the whole movie. I watched some of it last night as a precursor, and I watched a little bit during the day and this evening, so I caught bits and pieces. So that being said, there's a couple things I take away from the movie that's kind of interesting. I guess number one, first of all, is that politicians are humans too. This movie pretty much gave us a broad base of individuals who had challenges with truth, challenges with acknowledgments. Um, it's interesting, we talk about the tree and the hope. And you know, most of you may know I'm also a pharmacist. So I own a pharmacy. I'm responsible for the compliance officer in my business. And you know, we are, as a Medicaid Medicare provider, required to do annual training. And, and as my colleague Stephen Laughlin was here tonight, we'll admit, we in the legislature are required to do annual training. Matter of fact, last week I got the groan because we were assigned our training periods. Like, oh my God. Because when the budget starts, it's really not the best time to take the three hours out of your day to be doing it. But I will say this, as will happen with ethics and sexual harassment training in the legislature, 
as happens in my business every year, just as much as we think we know everything and we know how to do things the right way, when you actually take the time and are reminded and go through this training, all of a sudden it says, geez, you know what? I may actually be kind of the right to reject that. Because the truth of the matter is, in life we get so busy sometimes, and we're always under pressure to get this done, to get that done, to take shortcuts. And all of a sudden you don't realize that you're actually not really following the process as you should. And that doesn't mean it rises to the level of criminal nature, but it actually can start to get you going down the path. Um, I'm, you know, as a pharmacist, I, over 32 years, have learned to read people very well. I can talk to patients and look them straight in the eye and know if they're telling me the truth or not. And um, it, it, it gets back to how we're growing up. Uh, Steve knows this because he's participated over the years. When I was mayor of Pajos, Kevin Kimmel and I started to co-chair the Academy of Care and Education. Because after being mayor for two years, being a pharmacist for 24 at the time. Uh, you know, the, the challenge is when you're dealing with people, if you're not dealing with the truth, you're not going to get anywhere. And we've always tried to start at the earliest ages of supporting programs in our elementary school levels that, you know, character is, is yours and you earn it and you need to build it. Um, and, you know, we always use the expression, you know, the sign of great character is doing the right thing and no one's looking. That's something that maybe some of my former colleagues could take a lesson from, is doing the right thing and no one's looking. But also, to your point earlier, as much as I don't look forward to having three hours every month of ethics training, the reality is you need to be reminded, not in a punishing manner, but an educational manner, on what is the right way to do things. Because it's very easy to get into that habit. Perfect segue because my next question is about punishment. In journalism, if you have a lapse and you can make up a story in which you call plagiarizing, the penalties are quite high. You know, they lose your job. Uh, the newspaper, the newspaper, the New York Times is famous for this. You've seen it in other places to run um, giant stories. They would put their own newspaper reporters on and expose what happened and how they look at the whole system. They'll wrench their hands and apologize. It's all very public and humiliating. Um, the result has been even lower to trust, I think, in, um, in the media than it is now, although lawyers, journalists, uh, lawmakers were you know, kind of among the threats of society's violence trust. So my question is, the punishment, and you saw that with each of the speakers that in the movie, they, they were very careful to say how much time they had and they talked about the consequences. Should we, does it serve uh, to reduce corruption I guess I'll go first again because I went first the last time. Um, I mean, I I think part of the problem that I see in politics is that people, just like the rest of us, right, they don't think they're going to get caught. And in, uh, in Albany, and to some extent in Congress, so they're all less educated on that, they have the, the systems of monitoring behavior basically self-monitoring entities. There's no real independent sort of oversight of what happens. I mean, if it wasn't for Pete Barraro, we probably wouldn't be having a conversation today. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, like, humans are a bell curve. There's angels on one side, devils on the other, and the rest of us in the middle. And how do you get the people in the middle to behave better? Part of that is people have to know that they could get hammered if they do something wrong. And everyone that was up there was saying, well, if I had only known that I was going to get caught, basically, I would never have done this. And we all say that, right? I mean, we all say that. The movie's quite clear. We all know that we're all on the same boat. Uh, but what keeps people from be behaving in an unethical or criminal way is a value set, which may prohibit them from doing that. And for many of us in the bell curve, uh, the possibility that you could get caught. And so another lesson, but this one I had already sort of thought about, was the lack of independence in the oversight of how people behave in the public arena. A 
allows people to think they, they're smarter than everyone, they won't get caught, and even if they do, it's just their colleagues that catch them. Uh, and that, I think, breeds a culture where everyone feels, well, not everyone, everyone feels like they could game the system, not everyone does it, but some do. And I, I think that's sort of a triggering point uh, for me in terms of enforcement. Uh, we all drive differently when there's a speed trap, but when we drive past the speed trap, we push down on the gas. Right? So there's two different things that happen here. One is you want to have more speed traps, and the other is, as the movie points out, some education on that when you drive too fast, you might cause a terrible accident for somebody else. So in a sense, it's sort of both elements of the thing. But in, all, uh, in Albany, I feel like there aren't any speed traps unless the U.S. attorney happens to drive up from Manhattan. Well, and he, he has more
makes it difficult for you to do searching capabilities. So it actually or we agree. Right. So then Blair knows this because I you know we, we talk over the summer, I have legislation introduced to provide that it be in the same format that's downloadable, readable, exportable. So that way if somebody's interested, whether it's John P. Public or Joan J. Journalist, they can actually go and start to search things quickly, like you know, McDonald's trucks. What does it mean? Um, we need to have even greater transparency because, you know, and this is where my friend Blair and I might disagree. There is a big push to have no or very limited outside income. People like myself who feel it's a citizen legislature feels that it's okay to have outside income but be fully accountable. And the one way to do that is to provide the tools to the interested public. Jeff, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Assemblyman McDonald, uh, again, without any real inside knowledge, but I think things are getting better. And certainly, if I look at this with all these disclosures and how they are available, certainly if I'm thinking about, if I'm a legislature, I'm thinking of cutting corner, I'm not going to do it. Uh, I think, yeah, the disclosure the, that can happen is, is it can be, be deterrent. You can talk to what Blair said, trying to figure out the appropriate punishment. I don't think anyone's saying here, gee, if you lie, you cheat, you should get uh, sent to be sent away for 20, 30 years. I think here the, the exposure, the possible exposure, loss of prestige, loss of a position can be sufficient. And I'm not a pro I don't have any prosecutorial background, and I'll, but I, my one venture into this area, uh, Senator Bruno had appointed me to the uh, capital defenders, and our job was to ensure the integrity of defense in, when we had the death penalty. And when Senator Bruno put me on the commission, I thought he was going to ask me, well, well, do you like, do you want the death penalty? Are you against it? He just said, do the right thing. And in looking at this, and some of the cases that we had, uh, whether it was that went, it's, it's horrible things. And people said, is the death penalty really going to deter that? And after sitting on all this, and even after the death penalty then was deemed unconstitutional, when I was chairperson of the uh, of the defenders. It's recognition that you don't need all those severe penalties to do the terror. So as long as you have something that's going to uh, stop someone from doing something. But now here it is, you have life without, uh, life sentence without parole, maybe that might even be too stiff. But the idea here is proportionality. And I don't think we should lose sight of that. I know if you read some newspapers, but they pick up the Post or uh, other papers, papers like that, they're really saying, you know, lock them up throw away the key. And that's wrong. I, I think here with pre going after, so high profile, it's now filtering down, that, that's going to be the answer. And again, I agree with the, the assemblyman about that point, about the transparency. That, that really is the key. Make it easy for people to realize this. And certainly in that regard, people are going to, in that power, is going to look at things. And I think that certainly goes on a little bit even further <coughs> on down the line. The idea that if professionals can lose their license, along those lines, that's going to be sufficient. And I, I know in this regard, I always have this, this fight with my wife, and she's always complaining about how, how is it that they locked Martha Stewart up for what, three, four years. That was an abomination. She really didn't do anything wrong. And again, maybe people, you know, she did do wrong, but whether or not four years is, is a punishment, that, that's something I think that we can't really agree upon. No one's ever going to agree upon. But the idea here is you, you need some sort of realistic uh, ability to make the exposure, and that's what transparency does. Unless you're Donald Trump, the highest position in the land, and then your connection with reality and the truth can be very loose, um, you can get away with yeah, alternative facts. Isn't that a welcome phrase? And you don't have to be transparent and, uh, and give out your tax returns. You don't have to answer the conflict of interest. How does that help in changing the culture? about uh, better, more ethical government state levels when we see that. Well, my comment to that is, what does that say about the culture? I mean, I, I think, you know, and we hear a lot about politicians speaking of transparency and compliance with the laws and the punishments, and one of the things I took away from the film was punishment is not the way that you bring about more ethical behavior. It goes much more baseline than that. And the American people, in one way or another, did make a statement that transparency is not what we're looking for. 
disclosure of your tax returns isn't the answer. You know, all of the things that, that have gone on in this election, it just raises the question of, of what is the answer in terms of really, you know, it's almost like it turned it on its head that, that now we're, we're questioning what are facts? I mean, what is the truth? What, it, what, it, what are your obligations as a politician? The reporter I've been told to give is just a fact, man. Now we're just repeating what those are. I need to get this lady back there and probably try to keep her. The, the, thesis, get her of, the thesis of the film seems to be that if you, if you lie repeatedly, then you at some point inoculate yourself from even being able to recognize the lie. And I think that we're seeing that play itself out. What do we, you know, I, I, it's all very nice. I mean, I went to law school here, I took ethics courses, I take them every few years, however many times I have to. But what do we do to interrupt this now? We got to interrupt this now. We are in big trouble. We got to interrupt this now. Bob, you had a comment you wanted to make? Yeah, I think that maybe focusing on what's happening at the national level, maybe we need to focus at the local level. You know, first of all, this state voted pretty emphatically against person who ended up with But Mr. Horner indicated something that I think is, is well worth focusing on. <clears throat> when will the assembly and the Senate really stop former Senator Tkachik and Mr. McDonald for you? What would it take for you to accept, for the legislature to accept independent oversight of your activities. Maybe short of that, what would it take for you and the other legislators to, to abide by a regulation, a new one that would say, you will send out your financial disclosure form to all your constituents as soon as it's made available so that it isn't hidden somewhere in a PDF. There are steps that could be taken locally that might seep upward somehow and give people the idea that, you know, <coughs> there is a cultural change taking place. Because I, I really think, okay, you let's, know, let's, we let's about what off. we do. So, okay. you know, when, when you get home tonight, just do a Google search to my website, my campaign website, and my state website, and there's a nice box that says, view disclosure for report. It's been there for six months. I introduced legislation to require all candidates or those in office to actually post on a tab on their websites, whether you're running for office or you're rerunning for office, to disclose it. Because I firmly believe we, the public, are guilty for letting politicians get to where they go. I'm, so, I'm not trying to direct, be directed. You know, I'm not going to apologize for Shelley or Dean. They made their own mistakes. But we, the public, elect these people. And I firmly believe, just like I talked about with the searchable that local report, we should also be telling people, here's who we are. Because, you know, I remember, Steve remembers this, you know, Lopez was sitting right next to me when I moved into the legislature. He got reelected with everything hanging around him. And I was like, how in God's name have people done that? They didn't know who he was. They didn't pay attention. So I have no problem doing that. I've been doing, matter of fact, I gave it to the time you to say, Hey, this is an interesting story. Do it after election. I was running on a post, but do it after election. We didn't even want to cover it. And as your example, seek don't wear to others, as we suggested. I, you know, that I, that I can't speak to. I think Senator Breslin, who is co-sponsor the bill, is doing as well. And eventually, at some point, all candidates should be doing it. And another point I want to raise, because you raised a good point about local. In this budget, in the governor's ethics proposal, that level of transparency that we're required to do at the state level is included in this legislation for any elected official to provide full disclosure who makes over $50,000 a year. We don't want to start penalizing the poor local who's a town supervisor for a group of 900 people. But city mayors, county executives, <coughs> they should be helped because corruption happens at not only in, in, in any business organization, happens in all levels of government. Just that you don't have enough resources to find it. And that, that really should be enough. I mean, you mentioned here about having some separate independent regulatory authority. I, I think that just is just too much. 
I think what I think what Salome is saying is a really good a good point. And, uh, and the other thing too is, uh, with that regard, we don't want to scare away well people who can really do well. Uh, I think having Assembly uh, uh, McDonald's character, uh, I'm not in his district, but this is the type of legislature we want. We don't want legislature we want. We don't want to scare away that caliber of person. And but the idea is when they walk into it, they realize I'm going to disclose that should be enough. But why keep on piling on? Why saying you can't make money? As we want this. I wasn't suggesting piling on. I was suggesting. But what sounded like sorry, but maybe I, I I just interpreted too much, but it sounded like you maybe that's what we were. No. So I, I'll, I'll take that back. Yeah. I'll pile on later. <laughs> <laughs>
or a professional liar like Kellyanne Conway, you know, where does where does spin you know such outrageous line? How do people tolerate it? Maybe it, some of what this gentleman said might have something to do with it, which is you know they make exceptions, right? We rationalize. We rationalize the, the lies. But they're tremendous rational. I mean. Uh, that would be the yeah. area of study. I'd like to see the scientists look at that. Well, I, th I think to me, you know, looking, because I think of ethics all day long and we're doing ethics programs, I'm finding this period really difficult because it gives me tremendous uh, pause. And, and what's really being ravaged in this country is social trust. There, and a lot of that is coming from the polarization that resulted in this election. I mean, I don't think, you know, every poll regardless of how accurate the polls. Donald Trump is not a popular president. He, he came in with the lowest rating. People did not vote for him, although some did. Um, it's like voting against a lot of things. So how do we, how do we some, somehow start to build social trust rather than taking it apart? And what concerns me so much right now is how much it is being taken apart and being undermined by our leaders um, on one side more than the other for me, but I think on, on both sides. That is, I just wanted to point out that people, a lot of people don't know. They don't have information. They're comfortable with uh, President Trump and what he's saying. They trust him. People who didn't vote for him are less likely to trust him. <coughs> but if you had more information about those conflicts of interest, that might reduce your anxiety. Or that might allow you to people know he's a liar and vote for him anyway. Because they have other things that they care about the liar. I think right. a lot of people know he's one, one of the one thing one thing I wanted to mention, because I think power structures, uh, you know, all the education in the world is not gonna change the power structures if you don't understand the power structures. And I think one simple thing that you could do in Albany to change and get away some of the power from the leaders because the corruption really happened at the leadership in the Senate in the Assembly because they control the I mean, process. Perhaps the governor's office. Well, I'm not, uh, you know, okay. Okay. <laughs> but I'm just going with the others. <laughs> if you, but they held the power. They controlled the process. And when you control the process, you can squeeze whoever wants to get to you through that process. What if we had a role, and this was a suggestion many have made in the legislature, is if you get a majority of senators or assembly members to sign on to your bill, it automatically goes to the floor. It is not stopped by any committee, it's not stopped by the leader, and that's democracy because a majority of the citizens who are who push those representatives, that's a majority, that's gonna pass those bills should get an automatic to the floor. And then you have the public has a way to push certain issues through that avenue, and then you can focus on those members that are not, you know. We are, we are right at the limit. Are you gonna, are you gonna yell at me? No, no, no Can no, I come no. and go on a little bit more? Yes, okay. please. I just, I just want to add that one other simple thing we can do in Albany is open the Museum of Political Corruption. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, what should we be doing 
and why it doesn't matter so much in New York because you know we vote differently. So what what should we be doing? And he said, you know, modeling good government would make such a difference. Do not discount New York at all, and go local. Try to make government here better. It will make such a huge difference. So if there are proposals, I mean, just this room alone, if there were two proposals that came out and everybody in this room got their friends to write a letter about it, that would do something. I got one. We passed legislation in New York State that says you are not on our ballot running for president unless you disclose your tax returns. Yeah, that's a good one. Kathy, you just I want to thank everyone. 
everybody for coming. You have been so good. Your, and your questions, your comments have been great. I want to thank the panelists who, uh, who again, very illuminating. Thanks to our wonderful panel. Thank you.